The date is Sunday the 14th of April, 1912, and the White Star Line's new mail steamer, Titanic, is three days out from Queenstown on her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York. She is the world's largest passenger liner, second of a trio of massive ships built to ensure the preeminence of the White Star on the North Atlantic route. Before dawn breaks on Monday the 15th of April, the Titanic will have foundered and 1,500 of her passengers and crew will have drowned. The catastrophe truly is titanic, and its shattering consequences will reverberate around the world for as long as men go down to the sea in ships. Titanic will become a legend, but this is the true story of the fabulous ship and her sisters, Olympic and Britannic. It's a story of the beloved, the damned, and the forgotten. One evening back in 1907, two of the most important men in British shipping met in this house in London's Belgrave Square. The host was Lord Pirrie, chairman of Harlan and Wolfe, the famous Belfast shipbuilders. The guest was J. Bruce Ismay, chairman of the White Star Line and president of the International Mercantile Marine Lines, an American-based multinational which had recently acquired White Star. Ismay was engaged in the fiercest competition for passengers on the North Atlantic service then reaching its zenith. The trade consisted of wealthy transatlantic commuters, mainly the new American industrial aristocracy, and the emigrant tide which reached flood proportions in the decade leading up to the Great War. The essential elements of this competition were luxury, speed, and size. By 1907, the White Star, renowned for the highest standards of luxury, was under pressure from Cunard. This company had built two new express liners under government subsidy, the Lusitania, and the Mauritania. They were the largest and fastest yet built and looked like rendering the White Star fleet obsolete overnight. This was the main topic of conversation in Belgrave Square that evening. Piri and Ismay evolved a plan to counter Cunard with three giant ships, each of which would be half as big again as the new Cunarders. It was quite an evening. By the time it was over, they'd actually drafted an outline for the new ships that would become Olympic, Titanic and Britannic. The White Star Line never ordered a ship from any other yard but Harland and Wolfe. And likewise, Harland and Wolfe never built a ship for a competitor of the White Star. Work on the design of the new ships went ahead here, in the Queen's Island Drawing Office, under the supervision of Alexander Carlyle, the yard's managing director. Although Carlyle was later to say that he only attended to details, Peary himself was responsible for the design. Ships had always been built for the White Star on a cost-plus basis, that's to say, Harlan and Wolfe didn't quote a price. They simply built the ships to the customer's satisfaction, at whatever cost, then added their profit margin to the final figure. Such was the relationship between Harland and White Star. The names of the first two ships had been decided early, so at the yard, they became known as the Olympic Titanic class. Although one-third larger than any previous passenger tonnage, there was nothing revolutionary in their basic design. Piri and Ismay had decided on a large conventional vessel of medium speed only. The advantages were to be extremely strong construction, economy of operation, and a high degree of internal amenity. Including such features as electric lifts, an indoor swimming pool, automated gymnasium, and Turkish baths. There were two features of the design, however, which were destined to become controversial. The arrangement of bulkheads and the boat handling gear. The Cunardas Lusitania and Mauritania had been built with government money as armed auxiliary cruisers, should the need arise. Because of this, the hulls had been built to admiralty specification. This involved the provision of both conventional transverse bulkheads and additional longitudinal ones. 
known as torpedo bulkheads. The new White Star ships were never intended to become armed cruisers, therefore only transverse bulkheads were fitted. Later events were to highlight this fundamental difference in construction. The Olympic Titanic class hulls were divided into 16 watertight compartments by 15 massive steel walls called bulkheads. These steel walls extended well above the waterline and were higher fore and aft where collision damage was more likely. Large doors in the bulkheads were normally open to allow working access through the ship. These doors could be instantly closed by the flick of a switch on the bridge. The ships had a cellular double bottom, five feet three inches deep, and this arrangement, coupled to the massive strength of construction, meant that the ships could safely remain afloat with two of their largest compartments flooded, possibly even three. This gave rise to the beginnings of an unsinkability theory. The boat handling gear was the concern of Alexander Carlyle, and he decided to fit the ships with a new and revolutionary type of davit developed by a man named Wellin. The great advantage of Wellin's new davit was its ability to handle two or more lifeboats in succession from the same falls, the blocks and tackle used to lower the boat into the water. It seems likely that Carlyle was worried about the small number of boats required by the Board of Trade's rules, and anticipated a revision of these rules before the new ships entered service. Questions had already been raised in Parliament and the press about lifeboat provision in the big new liners. Carlyle wisely anticipated a rule revision which came too late. Unlike the new Cunardas, which were propelled by steam turbines and had a top speed of 27 knots, the Olympic Titanic class ships were only designed for medium speed and employed Harlan and Wolfe's novel arrangement of two four-cylinder triple expansion reciprocating engines and a low-pressure turbine in combination. Their service speed was to be a fairly sedate 21 knots. They were triple screw vessels of 46,000 horsepower, showing considerable economy over Cunard's quadruple screws of 70,000 horsepower. Where White Star would score over Cunard was the provision of ships of excellent stability and sea-keeping qualities, coupled with spacious luxury and every modern convenience. Like all Harland and Wolfe products, the new ships had graceful yacht-like lines which completely belied their huge size and massive construction. This vast open space is all that remains of numbers two and three slips at the Queen's Island Yard in Belfast. Here, Olympic, Titanic and Britannic were built and launched. No shipyard had ever attempted to build ships so big and Harlands had first to devise the means. They constructed these two giant slips especially for the job and spanned them both with an enormous gantry. Known as the Arrow Gantry, it remained a Belfast landmark for over 60 years before it was finally demolished in the early 1970s. With three ships to build and only two slips, the plan was this. The keel of Olympic would be laid on slip number two and building started. The keel of Titanic would then be laid on three slip. The hulls would then rise together with Olympic about three months ahead of Titanic. When Olympic was launched, the third keel, Britannic, would immediately be laid and she would start building alongside the nearly completed Titanic. But it was on Olympic that all eyes were fastened. She was the pioneer ship, a wonder of the modern age. While the army of riveters, platers, holder uppers, carpenters and corpers formed that beautiful hull, the foundry produced faultless castings of awe-inspiring size and complexity. In the engine shop, the big reciprocators were erected with loving care, each one weighing 995 tons. The center shaft turbines first turned on a giant lathe to the nicest tolerances, then fitted with thousands of turbine blades, each one precisely aligned. In the boiler shop, 29 boilers for each ship, 24 double-enders with six furnaces each, and five single-enders with three furnaces each, 159 furnaces in all, each one to be hand-fired with shovel and slice. As Olympic's launch day approached, the hull was painted white for the official photographers. No detail was to be left unrecorded.
Today, Harland and Wolfe are still successful shipbuilders at a time when British shipbuilding has declined to an all-time low. The way ships are built has changed fundamentally since the building of Olympic and her sisters. Gone are the riveters, replaced by welders. Ships are now fabricated in sections, and each completed section is then lifted bodily to the building basin, where it is welded to its neighbor. Even the superstructure, which used to be built up in fitting out basin, is now prefabricated on the ground, then lifted into position. The lifting and moving of such large prefabricated sections has necessitated two enormous traveling gantry cranes, over 300 feet high, and capable of lifting 800 tons each. These two cranes have replaced the old Arrol Gantry as Belfast's principal landmark. On May 31st, 1911, Belfast enjoyed a gala occasion. The completed Olympic was handed over to the owners and Titanic was launched. ships had cost three million pounds, a very large sum in 1911. That same day, with the VIPs aboard, Olympic sailed for Liverpool and Southampton. Never has any ship been the subject of such praise and adulation, and amid loud fanfares of publicity, she departed from Southampton on June the 13th, 1911, bound for Cherbourg, Queenstown, and New York on her maiden voyage. Mr. and Mrs. J. Bruce is married and Ismay's cable to Perry said it all. Olympic is a marvel and has given unbounded satisfaction. Once again, accept my warmest and most sincere congratulations. While Titanic was still fitting out in Belfast, Olympic suffered a misfortune that was to cast the first shadow over the fabulous sisters. She came into collision with the cruiser HMS Hawk while negotiating the difficult turn from Southampton Water to Cowes Roads at the Bram. In view of the fact that the Hawk rammed Olympic on her starboard quarter, it's difficult to understand why the official inquiry found Captain E.J. Smith of Olympic to blame. The incident cast a spell of doom over both captain and ship and fueled the natural superstitiousness of the crew. Some of them even said Olympic was a death ship. Olympic returned to Belfast for repairs and could be seen alongside the almost completed Titanic. Nobody could have foreseen that it was to be the last time the two sisters would ever be together. At 6 a.m. on the morning of April the 2nd, 1912, Titanic left the Queen's Island Yard for her sea trials. Tugs maneuvered her out into Belfast Loch, slipping their lines, and the stately ship headed for the open sea. She steamed to the Isle of Man to swing compasses, and 12 hours later at 6 p.m. she returned to Belfast. Everything had gone without a hitch. She left almost immediately for Southampton, where she arrived at midnight on the 4th. Titanic sailed under the command of Captain E.J. Smith, Commodore of the White Star Line, with a complement of officers and crew largely transferred from Olympic. 
Captain Smith was about to retire. Ismay had asked him to stay on just for Titanic's maiden voyage. This is the ocean dock at Southampton, but the few passenger liners that use the port these days berth down on the test quay. The ocean dock is quiet and deserted, left to its memories. The dock was completed in early 1912 and for 10 years was known as the White Star Dock. Titanic occupied this berth from midnight on the 4th of April until she sailed on the 10th. That last hectic week before sailing was particularly trying for a young naval architect named Thomas Andrews. A nephew of Lord Pirry, he had recently taken over as managing director of Harland and Wolfe. Tom Andrews knew every rivet of Titanic and had come over with a small gang from the shipyard to attend to any last minute problems. Tom and the men were to sail with the ship. None of them would ever see Belfast again. The Board of Trade Surveyor passed the ship and its life-saving equipment and by the eve of sailing Tom Andrews was able to write to Piri, I think she will do the old firm credit when we sail tomorrow. Just after noon the following day, Titanic sailed. No fanfares, just people who'd come to see others off. It was as routine as any liner sailing when something dramatic occurred. As Titanic inched her way out of the dock, the liner New York suddenly snapped her mooring lines and dragged towards the Titanic as though she were a giant magnet. Captain Smith stopped Titanic dead and the collision was narrowly avoided. But it had been too close for comfort. And once again, superstitious foreboding spread among the crew. With the panic over, Titanic glided down the Solent towards Spithead, and Captain Smith must have been glad to be gaining the open sea at last. Many people watched the new ship pass and would later tell children and grandchildren, I saw the Titanic that day. As the great ship headed across the channel to Cherbourg, the passengers enjoyed tea and admired the stylish facilities. Far below them, in the engine rooms, Chief Engineer Bell was still having trouble. Titanic had arrived at Southampton during a coal strike, and to bunker the 6,000 tons or so necessary for the voyage, coal had to be manhandled out of the liners Oceanic and New York, a dirty and laborious business. Now he had a fire in one of the bunkers, number six. Nothing too serious, but no way to start a maiden voyage. At noon the following day, Titanic dropped anchor in Queenstown Harbour, last port of call on her passage to New York. Today, Queenstown is called Cove, and the days when transatlantic liners called here are just a memory. Trains still serve the Quayside station, but now they only carry local people going about their daily business. In days gone by, boat train passengers were embarked in tenders to be taken out to the big steamers at anchor in the harbour mouth. Titanic's fresh paint shone as she stood out in clear view of the little town. St. Coleman's Cathedral, in its dominating position, was still unfinished in 1912, and passengers on Titanic's decks would have seen the park-built spire. Thousands of young Irishmen and women have boarded liners here, bound for a new life and a new world. For most, it would be their last sight of home. A 
At 1.30 p.m., Titanic sailed from Queenstown and ran down the Irish coast towards Fast Net and the open Atlantic. On board were now 324 first-class passengers, 285 second, 706 third, and 885 crew. 2,200 in total. In the engine rooms far below the deep-piled and panelled elegance of the first class, Chief Engineer Bell now had things under control. The bunker fire was still burning, but Titanic was performing like the thoroughbred she was. First day out of Queenstown, she ran 386 miles. Second day, 519 miles. Third day, 546 miles. 21.7 knots. Titanic was working up nicely. Not as fast as Olympic on her maiden voyage, but not bad, just the same. At 10 p.m. on the night of Sunday, 14th of April, while still 500 miles from Cape Race, Newfoundland, First Officer Murdoch relieved Second Officer Lightoller on the bridge. It was a clear, moonless night, the sea an oily calm. The only breeze was created by Titanic's easy 22 knots. The temperature had been falling for the last three hours. It was freezing. Titanic was slicing through the cold, ink-black water while on board, in the warm and comfortable security of her glittering superstructure, passengers made their way to bed, or lingered over a last nightcap. At 11.40 p.m., three bells rang at the lookout high on the foremast. Almost immediately, a telephone rang. Moody, junior officer of the watch, answered. Ice, right ahead. Murdoch instantly rang the telegraph to stop, then full astern, at the same time ordering the helm, harder starboard. The seconds that followed must have seemed like hours to Paul Murdoch as the huge berg loomed ahead and Titanic slowly answered her helm. Murdoch now ordered hard a port to swing the stern clear, but almost at the same moment Titanic struck the berg a glancing blow. The impact seemed slight enough that Murdoch promptly closed all watertight doors, setting alarm bells jangling below. At that moment, none of the officers on the bridge had any idea of the extent of the damage. In fact, the damage was both enormous and catastrophic. Titanic, the fabulous ship, was mortally wounded, beyond all hope of saving. The glancing blow from the iceberg had torn a jagged cut through her plates, 10 feet above the keel, extending 250 feet along her starboard side, from forepeak to number six boiler room. This meant that five of her watertight compartments had been breached and were filling rapidly. It took half an hour to sound the ship and discover the extent of the damage and by then, Captain Smith knew the awful inevitability of what was to follow. Titanic had a little over two hours to live, if the bulkheads held. As the forward five compartments filled, overcoming the efforts of the pumps, the ship's head would sink lower and lower into the sea. Eventually, the water would reach the upper extent of each bulkhead and flow over into the next compartment. It was as simple as it was inevitable. For Chief Engineer Bell, there were some more immediate problems. He must keep steam on the pumps to slow the rate of inundation as far as possible, and he must keep steam on the generators. To have the lights fail would cause instant panic. Titanic's powerful radio transmitter began to stutter out the international distress call, CQD. Soon after, the new call, SOS, was sent for the first time. The Frankfurt replied, then the Mount Temple, the Carpathia and the Olympic. In no time, the ether was buzzing with the news of Titanic's distress. All passengers were told to put on their life jackets and go up to the boats. There never had been a boat drill, and in other circumstances, panic and confusion might have resulted. As it was, most passengers detected little wrong with the ship and were reluctant to take the matter seriously. The call to put women and children into the boats met with considerable lack of enthusiasm. After all, wasn't the ship virtually unsinkable? And who would want to be lowered over 60 feet in an open boat in the pitch dark? At 12.45 a.m., over an hour after the collision, the first boat was ready for lowering. It was a little over half full. Titanic was well down at the head by now and the lifeboat started to leave the ship at regular intervals. The band had assembled on the boat deck and were playing ragtime. The last boat to be lowered left at five past two, full now as the tragedy reached its finale.
Just before 2.20 a.m. on Monday the 15th of April, 1912, the stern of Titanic rose up for the final plunge. The lights went out, came back on again, then went out for the last time. Moments later, she was gone. 712 survivors were picked up by the Cunard liner Carpathia just before dawn that morning. Among the saved were J. Bruce Ismay, 2nd Officer Lytola, 3rd Officer Pittman, 4th Officer Boxhall, 5th Officer Lowe, and Junior Wireless Operator Harold Bride. 1,502 people were lost, among them Captain E.J. Smith, Chief Officer Wilde, 1st Officer Murdoch, Purser McElroy, Surgeon O'Loughlin, Chief Engineer Bell, Senior Wireless Operator Phillips, Tom Andrews, also no less than nine American millionaires whose combined capital represented some 120 million pounds. Never again would man place so much faith in his own ingenuity. Three weeks after Titanic went to the bottom, the official inquiry opened at the Scottish Drill Hall, Buckingham Gate, in London's Westminster. It lasted for 36 days, the longest wreck inquiry in history, and during its course, some 98 witnesses were asked a total of over 25,000 questions. The president of the commission was Lord Mersey of Toxteth, receiver of wrecks. It might well be supposed that such an exhaustive inquiry would have left no stone unturned in its search for the truth. In fact, it was a whitewash. The Board of Trade, on whose behalf the inquiry was held, were in an embarrassing position. Because of their hopelessly out-of-date rules, they had permitted Titanic to sail with a certificate for 3,500 passengers and crew, but lifeboat accommodation for only 1,178 people. These rules, which hadn't been revised in 18 years, grouped passenger ships by tonnage, without any reference to the actual number of people carried. And if this wasn't ludicrous enough, the upper limit of their classification system was for vessels of 10,000 tons and over, requiring 16 boats under davits. The White Star Line were quick to point out that they had exceeded this requirement. Titanic had 20 boats, but Titanic was a vessel of over 46,000 tons, four and a half times the size of the board's highest class. The White Star's position was little better. Captain Smith had sailed into a known danger area with barely adequate lookout and with no reduction in speed. This sounded awfully like negligent navigation. In the event, both the Board of Trade and the White Star got off the hook, although Ismay received some pretty rough treatment at a personal level. Poor Ismay. The press had been after him ever since he landed in New York, and it wasn't long before the same accusations were made at the inquiry. His crime, it seems, was to have survived at all, they tried to brand him a coward, but in the end, Mersey completely exonerated him. Mud sticks, however, and the Titanic affair cast a shadow over the remainder of his life. Lord Mersey and the Board of Trade found the scapegoat they so badly needed in Captain Stanley Lord, master of the Leyland liner, Californian. By the cannibalization of conflicting and largely circumstantial evidence, they sought to prove that Lord's ship was in clear sight of the Titanic as she lay sinking. Lord was asleep and wouldn't get up, and his watch officer took little interest and no action to render assistance. If true, this was about the most damning charge that could be made against a shipmaster. It's a bizarre story and remains the most controversial aspect of the whole inquiry. To support their charge against the luckless Captain Lord, it was necessary for the court to establish that no other ships were in the vicinity of Titanic but one, the Californian. We now know that there were quite a number Captain Stanley Lord was the only man censured in connection with the loss of Titanic, and this in itself was a miscarriage of justice. Under English law, no man may be censured who has not first been made a party to the proceedings. Captain Lord hadn't. He was merely a witness. Fifty years later came the disclosure that the so-called standby ship seen from Titanic's decks was a Norwegian sealer, the Samson. The Board of Trade were asked to reopen that part of the inquiry which concerned the Californian. They declined.
The appalling consequences of the sinking of Titanic shook the shipping industry to its foundations. For the White Star Line, it was potentially a death blow. A few days after the disaster, as Olympic lay loading at Southampton, the general public disquiet was highlighted by a large number of firemen and trimmers walking off the ship and refusing to return until more boats were put on board. Olympic completed five more round trips during the summer of 1912 before returning to Belfast for major alterations. The cellular double bottom was extended upwards to four feet above the load line and the bulkheads were also extended, some by as much as 40 feet. The result of this refit was that Olympic could now float with any six of her compartments open to the sea. Lifeboats were fitted along the entire length of the boat deck and were nested to increase capacity. Olympic returned to the mail run in late 1913 and public confidence returned as memories of the Titanic horror dimmed. On August the 4th, 1914, the Great War started, and although for a time Olympic continued in commercial service, a year later she was requisitioned by the Admiralty as an unarmed naval transport. In this role, she successfully evaded three separate submarine attacks by virtue of high speed. Later in the war, she was armed with six-inch guns for what was termed defensive purposes. Painted in a bizarre dazzle camouflage, she suffered a fourth submarine attack. This time, she sank the submarine the U-103, and became the only British passenger liner ever to sink an enemy ship. During her war service, Olympic steamed 184,000 miles and carried over 120,000 passengers, civilian and military, without the slightest mishap. She became known as the Old Reliable, a nickname she well deserved. Because of the structural modifications dictated by the Titanic disaster, Britannic wasn't launched until February the 26th, 1914. Like Olympic, her double bottom had been extended four feet above the load line and her bulkheads had all been extended upwards. She was able to remain afloat with six of her compartments flooded and was undoubtedly one of the safest passenger ships ever built. From the builder's model, we can see how she would have looked in service. The extraordinary boat handling gear looks almost like overreaction on the part of White Star. But Britannic was destined never to sail under their flag. On November 13, 1915, she was requisitioned as a hospital ship. The conversion took less than one month. When complete, she had accommodation for 3,310 patients. His Majesty's hospital ship Britannic sailed for Gallipoli, where Churchill's now infamous campaign was collapsing with colossal casualties. One year later, on November the 21st, 1916, while outward bound on her sixth trip to the Eastern Mediterranean, Britannic struck a mine made by a German submarine, the U-73. The mine struck the starboard side near the bulkhead between numbers two and three holes. Moments later, no less than five compartments were flooding. 250 feet were open to the sea. The ship became totally unmanageable, taking a severe less to starboard, and within the hour, it disappeared below a calm Aegean sea. 28 people lost their lives. 1,106 were rescued, including, incredibly, two Titanic survivors. It is impossible to accept the official version of what happened. Why did the 48,000-ton ship, able, remember, to float with six of her compartments flooded, found her so quickly and with such a list that she actually capsized? Hadn't her sister, Titanic, stayed afloat for over two hours with no less than six compartments flooding? Survivors testified to a series of internal explosions. What caused these explosions? Why did the Germans, shortly afterwards, announce that they could no longer respect the status of British hospital ships? The inescapable conclusion is that Britannic was loaded with contraband and the enemy had realized this.
Of the three mighty ships which Piri and Ismay had planned and built, only Olympic now remained. After the war, Olympic again returned to Belfast to be refitted for her peacetime role in the North Atlantic. She was extensively modernized and converted to burn oil instead of coal. She was the first of the big liners to be converted. During the following decade, Olympic enjoyed her golden years. Catering for the elite of transatlantic travellers, this most elegant of ships was a firm favourite. It seemed that she'd finally dispelled that aura of bad luck that had dogged her early life, and her intimate connection with Titanic was largely forgotten. In 1934, the British government enforced a merger of the old rivals, Cunard and White Star, as a precondition to pumping in public money. Both companies were in trouble, and Cunard had a new mammoth liner on the stocks with no funds to complete her. The merger signalled the end of the road for Olympic. Sad to say, in this last year of her life, she suffered a fatal collision. She ran down and sank the Nantucket lightship in fog. Seven men lost their lives. It was a bad way to end an illustrious career and raised again that spectre of ill luck so long forgotten. Arriving in New York after the disaster, the huge Olympic shows no evidence of the collision. A little paint off her bows is the only mark she bears. Captain Binks of the Olympic was a rescued Captain Braithwaite of the lightship. Let me shake hands. Shake hands. A sailor to a sailor. Yeah. The other lucky survivors, right to left, Oliver Roberts, Perry, the wireless operator, and Mosher, the mate, will tell their simple stories. Well, it all happened so quick we had no chance to... We only know just how we all had our life as well as good thing we did. Uh, well, at the time of the smash, I was in the red, the radio cab, and I had barely time to get on deck and swim for my life. I was down at sea by the time of the crash. It's really a mess that I come up to sudden. But the life was through a short on a job at a time. Everything went about quickly. Team up for the last time. The Olympic of the Southampton, her deck's empty. And for the last time, the blue Peter fluttered from her masthead. The old white star liner is sailing on her last voyage, en route for Jarrow and the shipbreakers, but there is no send-off. She had a wonderful war record, sinking two enemy submarines and carrying thousands of troops in safety. They called her the old reliable. Now her days are done, and away she goes, reliable to the last. Jarrow, which has suffered as severely as any of the depressed areas from the bitterness of unemployment, is in luck's way at last. And all along the banks of the Tyne, crowds wait to see the Olympic arrive at the end of her last voyage. The 46,000 ton liner is on her way to the shipbreaking yard and brings 18 months work and 100,000 pounds in wages to the hard hit town. So the tragedy of the Olympics last trip becomes a journey of good omen for the Tynesider. Journey then. After 24 years service as a luxury liner, the Olympics makes her last voyage. 
Two years ago, the great vessel was handed over to be dismantled, a godsend to many unemployed on time side. And now she goes for her final demolition at Inverkeeping. Compare the pathetic house of the day with the magnificence of the Olympic in her prime. The Oceanic Steam Navigation Company, better known as the White Star Line, was founded by Thomas Ismay, Bruce's father, in 1869. After the merger with Cunard in 1934, the White Star slowly but relentlessly faded away. By 1960, its last ship was on her way to the breakers, and the final curtain was lowered on the once mighty White Star. For many among an older generation of transatlantic travellers, Olympic remained the finest of all the big liners. So much smoother and quieter than the Cunard Express boats, and so much more elegant than the Queen's with their Odeon Cinema decor. Oddly enough, one white star boat has survived, in Paris. Just across the Seine from the Eiffel Tower lies the Nomadic, and here we have a direct link with Olympic and Titanic. Nomadic was one of the two tenders, the other one was the traffic, built especially to serve the new ships at Cherbourg. Andrews had written to his wife when Titanic called at Cherbourg. The two little tenders look very fine. You remember we built them last year? Over 70 years later, Nomadic lives up to her name and proudly holds the distinction of being last of the line. Looking back at the three ships from seven decades on, it's inevitable that the middle sister is best remembered. Titanic is probably the most famous ship in history. But how much of what is commonly believed about her is anything like true? It is said that Titanic was going at full speed through the ice because they were attempting a record passage. But this is nonsense. Titanic wasn't a fast ship. In fact, she was slower than Olympic had been on her maiden voyage. It is often suggested that Titanic was well to the north of her proper track, cutting the corner, again to achieve a record passage. All the evidence shows that, if anything, she was south of her designated course. It is said that Titanic was claimed to be the unsinkable ship. It certainly seems that many people believed this at the time, but neither White Star nor Harland and Wolfe had ever made such a claim. The phrase virtually unsinkable had been used by the press and White Star was seemingly happy with the description. It proved to be a piece of free publicity they would sorely regret. It is said that Titanic was a floating palace, the most luxurious ship ever to put to sea. She certainly was luxurious. This was a hallmark of the White Star line, but she was very little different from her elder sister. It is said that Titanic sailed on her maiden voyage in a blaze of publicity, the world's most fabulous ship. Afraid not. Titanic slipped quietly away, virtually unnoticed, and well short of a full loading of passengers, mercifully. It has sometimes been suggested that far from being unsinkable, Titanic was a badly designed and constructed ship, and that other ships could have survived the collision. This theory was advanced at the inquiry and they were thinking of those torpedo bulkheads in the Cunardas. Sadly, within three years, events were to prove them wrong. In 1915, Lusitania was struck by a torpedo off the old head of Kinsale. So seriously was her stability affected that she listed heavily to starboard and sank within 18 minutes. The list prevented nearly all attempts to launch her lifeboats. Contrast this with Titanic, one third of her entire length open to the sea, taking two hours, 40 minutes to founder and never with a list that seriously hampered the filling and lowering of her boats. It is often firmly asserted that had Titanic carried sufficient lifeboats, everyone on board would have been saved. This is tempting to believe, but again the facts are against it. Because of reluctance to leave the ship, 
Many of the early boats left less than half full. Titanic's boat had a capacity for 1,178 people, yet only 652 left in these boats, and only another 60 were picked up from the sea. It is said that Titanic ignored a number of ice warnings as she approached the ice field, and unfortunately, this is partly true. But the real problem lay in the tradition of the service. Western Ocean mail boats did not reduce speed in the vicinity of ice unless visibility was poor. It was a bad tradition. Finally, it is often said that the Titanic disaster was a supreme example of British stiff upper lip chivalry and correctness. It was women and children first and no panic. While it is undoubtedly true that there were many, many cases of extreme bravery and certainly very little panic until near the end, much of this particular myth was manufactured in the inquiry. Sadly, in reality, it was a muddle. The crew didn't know their boat station. There had never been a drill. The passengers didn't respond to danger because nobody had told them there was any danger. However the matter was glossed over, access to the lifeboats was dictated by class. Lord Mersey was to conclude that the third-class passengers were fairly treated. Yet not a single third-class passenger was called to give evidence. More first-class men were saved than third-class children. This, then, has been the story of the fabled ship and her sisters, Olympic, the old reliable, and the tragic hospital ship Britannic. But only Titanic remains part of our folk memory. If all the hot air talked about her over the decades could be harnessed to raise her, she'd pop up like a cork. Instead, Titanic would always be remembered as the most poignant of all sea disasters. Like a classical tragedy, all the fates played their parts. Bruce Ismay and the surviving officers were cleared, but they were never forgiven. Ismay retired and became a virtual recluse, and none of the officers was ever given a command. But, in spite of the witch hunts, the slanders, and the accusations, maybe it was, after all, an act of God. <laughs>